Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria, and I've got a very special guest with me today who is Anthony Cummins. Um, now you may be familiar with Anthony's work, um, or you may not, and so I'm going to throw you straight over to Anthony and let him introduce who he is and what he does. And uh, before he does that, I'm just going to say we are today going to be talking about ninjas. That's right. And now I have deliberately avoided the subject of ninjas on my channel, more or less, uh, over all the years that I've been making videos, because it's just not, it's not really my area. It's not my area of expertise. I could research it and say some things, but I thought, you know what, let's actually go to someone that studies this stuff so that we can talk about this topic. And so what we're going to be looking at today is basically an introduction uh, to what ninjas and ninjutsu are, some of the myths, uh, some of the myth busting, um, and yeah, some of the facts and figures of, of what ninjas actually are or were. Um, so, Anthony, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Right, my name is Anthony Cummins and I'm from Manchester, England. And basically, I went off to Japan to research the ninja. So, I'm a uh, historical researcher and an author, and I found that the history of the ninja didn't really match with what was being taught in Japan. So I went over there thinking, I'm going to go train with some ninjas. I'm going to, you know, really get going. But it didn't add up. So what I've done is I've spent the last 10 to 15 years searching Japan for every ninja scroll that we can find, putting a team together, including a monk, Japanese writing experts, translation experts, and pulling them together to translate everything into English and then get it published and then sort out the history of the ninja. So just to be clear with everyone, I'm not the Japanese speaker of the team. I'm just sort of like a producer, if you like, and a, the person who's organised and everything. And my job is to make sure when the translations come through, they then get cleaned up and we start using the correct terms and military terms and we start putting things together and produce it for everyone. OK, so um, before we go on, I'm just going to say underneath this video will be a link to obviously your channel. Um, so you've got a YouTube channel and that's one of the other things you do as well. Um, but also specifically, I'll put a link to a documentary that you put together explaining how you came into this and, and your kind of discoveries and the some of the history of the ninja and the mythology of the ninja as well, uh, which we'll talk about a bit about here. Um, so viewers of this check out that link uh, below if you if you want to find out a little bit more in depth as well about uh, anthony's journey as it were now my understanding from watching that was that you did start out studying ninjutsu or bujinkan in the uk originally yes i did uh, 1999 at salford and then with somebody who came from the northeast who was a sixth dan and taught me and my friends in the local area so yes i was one of the sort of ninja maniacs who wanted to be a ninja went to japan to train with the ninjas and then sort of sledgehammer in the face of like oh this isn't right let's sort this out okay well let's talk more about that as as uh, as we go along so the first question headline um because not everybody will watch all of um all of every video and i think that we're going to be talking for a little while here but one of the things that i really wanted to hit on and one of the reasons i contacted you was i had heard and bearing in mind i'm not a, a specialist at all in japanese history or japanese martial arts and certainly not in uh, ninja or ninjutsu is um were the ninja actually a thing and i have had people say to me well ninjas are just complete myth they didn't actually exist were ninjas real Yes, they absolutely were real. However, when did they exist or what name did they go by becomes a problem. So we have documentary for the word ninja. So basically, the word ninja is actually not used till the 20th century. So right. people start thinking, oh, you know, that means they didn't exist till the 20th century. That's not correct. The Japanese characters or Chinese characters can be read two ways. So the original way of reading this is shinobi no mono. But those same characters are found in history as early as the 1570s. And if we don't believe that date, which some people don't, there is no doubt that it appears in the early 1600s and then it litters Japanese texts everywhere. So to say they never existed is like tantamount to ridiculous. It's there. That term is pushed throughout Japanese stuff for about 500 years. So as uh, someone who, who's in my 40s, I remember um, a um, video game with the word shinobi, several video games with the word shinobi in them. So should we say shinobi rather than ninja? Yes, we should. We should totally say shinobi no mono, or it's then just dropped to shinobi, 
or shinobi no jutsu, which means like, you know, the ways of the shinobi. But the word ninja is so popular that even I say, I, you know, people are like, no, not having it. It's like Tao and Tao. You know, it's uh-huh. the same thing. They still publish books as Tao because it's so popular. Was so, it, yes, correct. Similarly, in a kind of European history or medieval and HEMA um, perspective, we often refer to knights when actually a lot of these people were men at arms. They weren't knighted. Uh, but obviously, especially in the world of the Internet, if there's a popular term, you kind of got to use it if you want anyone to find your books or your videos or anything else. Um, and so, you know, obviously this goes even further into the spelling of things. And I have to spell it. It kills me. But I have to spell armor the American way uh, for people to find my videos. Um, <laughs> and- <laughs> I do too. With samurai armor, I'm like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Are more, um, but yeah. So okay, so we should perhaps say shinobi more than ninja. But at the end of the day, it's about communication, and as long as we know what we're talking about. So the shinobi, I'll try and call them shinobi. The shinobi, aka ninja, did exist. In a nutshell, who were they and what did they do? Right. In a nutshell, the stereotypical ninja that you're thinking of, or the shinobi no mono, is basically somebody connected to the military force, the samurai force. They are either samurai in class or Ashigaru foot soldiers, Mm -hmm. uh, depending on what role they take up. And they are attached to the force as espionage agents, clandestine agents, scouts, close scouts, not major scouts, so close scouted. They're also classic spies. They go behind enemy lines. They will literally be eating dinner with the enemy and then set fire to things. Or they could be patrolling outside or even protecting the Lord. So imagine... um, a medieval SAS Navy SEALs with a dash of CIA with a bit, a little bit of black wizardry Merlin involved. And you're close to what they are. Okay. Well, this idea about the sort of Shinobi and the samurai being separate are not, is not true. OK, so they're, okay. So they're sort of um, a cross between special forces and an espionage and spy, spies, a bit like, like MI6 or, or like, like you say, SBS, SAS, Navy SEALs, that kind of mixed all together how do we know this right we know this just so this takes us to go back right so where do we find information about the shinobi where is it so the very first mention of the word shinobi comes in something called the tai heiki the chronicle of great peace which is around around 1375 but then it just goes dead the word just it seems to be lost And then it reappears in the late 1500s, very early 1600s. But this is where it's a problem. The word shinobi is actually both a noun and a verb and a few other things I can never keep up with grammatically. And it depends how it is used in a sentence. So that's going to get really complicated. So the best way I can describe it is like this. I was in my house and an intruder came in the house or somebody infiltrated my house. Or I could say an infiltration agent infiltrated my house or i can say special forces came through my door Mm -hmm. they're all in japanese the word shinobi okay but they mean different things depending on the context however going back to this 1300s one we have definitely two sentences where even the japanese are like that that's got to be a name for a specific person then it disappears and about 1570 we start to see it again however some people have said that the scrolls that they are in are not real Because, of course, we're Japanese, it's a humid country, the paper disintegrates, and most things we have are transcriptions, not the original. Okay. So they said that date is wrong. But we definitely, 100%, have it by 1600 from the Jesuits who produce a uh, dictionary. And I've just been going through that now. And they actually spell shinobi, which tells us why it's spelled shinobi, with an X. So I looked under S for years trying to find it, and it's with an X, and somebody else found it. Shinobi. So um, that says somebody who creeps in, follows, uh, and even breaks into enemy castles at night. Okay, so that's uh, essentially a Euro- European source then, or is that Japanese yeah. converted to? No, it's uh, well, it's um, the Jesuits went over and they made this dictionary. I think it's got 29,000 different Japanese terms in, and okay. some. We found it, Shinobi, person who infiltrates at night, creeps into castles and all that. And the date on the dictionary is actually 1603, but it says in the introduction it's taken us years to do this. So you're looking at 1590s at Sekigahara, at the major battles of Japan, the word the Shinobi are definitely in action. 
So if if the word shinobi is describing someone doing something sneaky, um, essentially, then or, or something, uh, yeah, special forces ish or, or um, espionage ish, couldn't that description simply be describing someone doing that job rather than a special group of people who are only doing that job? If you sort of mean, yes, that's exactly the sort of the problem we have. So. But no, we do find it. So what happens then is the early 1600s, peace comes and we start to get army listings. And this is where we'll put the, put the ideograms on screen. The word shinobi alone can mean those things. But shinobi no mono is a man that is doing this. Or And we find in army listings. And so you've got spears, lancers, grenadiers, whatever you want to call them, all the way down. He's got shinobi right there. Shinobi no mono. Then we also have shinobi shu, groups who do shinobi. And then we also know from... Uh, so there's a document called the Gumpo Jioshu from uh, a man called Ogasawara, and he literally is writing in 1610, and he says no army is not complete without its shinobi group, shinobi shu, and they should be specialists from Iga and Koka. From Iga and Koka, what's what's that then? So Iga, and a lot of people say Koga or Aiga. It's actually Iga and Koka, and these are two small places next to each other in Mie. Ken, Mie province, basically. And they have got a ring of mountains. Now, this is where the myth of the ninja are on their own, you know, outside samurai law comes from. Because what happens is, for some reason, in the 1500s, possibly the 1400s, there's just an explosion of sort of um, clandestine warfare, if you want to call it, or, you know, sneaky beaky stuff happening in this area. It's not the only place, though. Everybody says it's the only place. It's not. It's the best place. So for some reason, these guys go out everywhere and are hired by all the daimyo lords and become famous across all Japan. And it like we have tons of evidence, really. People say you must always have eager and coca mono. So even though we have the word shinobi no mono, mono, by the way, guys, means just person. So a person of shinobi. Okay. So we find that we have eager mono and coca mono. You must have these guys. So, they, so I suppose for, for people who, you know, don't necessarily know much at all about Japanese history, you could liken it with, uh, for example, in the British Army in the 19th century, certain types of soldiers were sourced from certain parts of the British Empire, perhaps most famously the Gurkhas. Um, so, so someone is there is comparison there in that, like, there are a particular type of soldier from a particular area who are known for their particular skills in this type of activity so therefore that's where you go and recruit those soldiers from is that a, is that a fair comparison yeah no, yeah. yeah and it actually created a problem so we have in documentation we have this it says you must have two types of shinobi ones who are famous from eager but the problem is they're all cousins and they'll talk to each other so if they are on opposite <laughs> sides of the force they end up selling secrets so make sure you have your own trained shinobi as well otherwise and then break it up you know you don't put all your espionage in one basket and you break it up and oh. sort of like then you we don't have a name for this person i've never found a name but it's implied and that's like a master strategist who's checking all the spy reports <laughs> but you know so that's the person so the the sources that talk about these shinobi being from these two areas and talk about their use and them appearing in army lists what are those sources? Where, where are you getting that from? Have other people published books about this? Are you drawing from primary sources, secondary, tertiary? Where do you get your knowledge from? Okay, so when I went over to this, there's so many problems in um, Japanese research. And I want to make this clear, the problems that came to us about the ninja all came from Japan. Everybody says, oh, we must ask the Japanese. You're like, Actually, they're the ones who gave us the problems. And they themselves know that it, the, the research is full of problems. Um, I was told, I don't have this quote, but I was told that a Japanese professor says the ninja are so corrupted in the in history, the history of ninja is so corrupt that you shouldn't touch them. It's a nightmare. It was that bad in the 20th century. So what I did is I got rid of all secondary sources. We ditched them all. And we went on to find every source I could. I went to the antique markets. There's obviously stuff that's online that people have put up. So the major sources. And they're, of course, you know, army listings, i.e. genuinely primary sources. But we do find these in books. Somebody will have transcribed it in a book. We find them in local libraries where I have to go to the library, pay for the photocopy or pay for a photographer in some cases to take the pictures of it. Or I can take the pictures myself. And I've even bought a few scrolls. And if you put all that together, we do it. However, it does all come from the Edo period. 
which is one of the overshadowing things from it. Because there is almost nothing from the Sengoku period, which for the viewers means at the time of war, when you really hope these guys would be writing it down, it's almost silent. But then once we hit the period of peace, it erupts. But that's not strange because dojo culture erupts in Japan. Mm. It's the same thing. I'm aware, I'm aware of that situation happening with Kenjutsu, for example, and other, and other old Japanese martial arts, whereby during the warring period, presumably people were too busy uh, with warring uh, to write this stuff down and codify this stuff. And then you get a sort of explosion of, like you say, dojo culture uh, and rival fencing schools and this kind of stuff in a, in a period of peace when you've got presumably these people with this expertise setting up rival, you know, trying to find a job for themselves in peacetime, probably, um, and um, and writing scrolls and uh, and this kind of stuff. And, and also, uh, to a degree, certainly with fencing, and this would obviously apply to the Japanese equivalent as well, I think people um, uh, looking at building up libraries uh, and documenting things, uh, which is something that you focus on in, in a time of peace, probably more uh, <laughs> than, than when yeah. you're busy, busy leading armies and stuff like this. So, uh, and, and there's, you know, all kind of kudos. And if you heard that someone did really good service 10 years ago in a certain war, then you're going to try and recruit them. So, that, you know, and we know this happened with Kenjutsu schools where they powerful lords got the the, the famous sword master to come and work for them and you know so that they they are kind of owned them basically and they got them to teach uh, uh, in their court and you know start a school and write you know write scrolls down and stuff so is it is it literally the case that 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 japan just has tons of these scrolls floating around and and that that mention things that are relevant to your studies that you I mean, like for example, with medieval and Renaissance manuscripts, they're not. There's not that many of them floating around. They tend to be in national libraries, in sometimes in private collections and art art collections and stuff. But you know, if I want to re if I want to research 16th century swordsmanship, then I have to go to the British Library, um, the uh, Royal Armouries, uh, the Wallace Collection. I need to go to specific places where these very valuable manuscripts have been kept. Are, are there I'm getting the impression from you that there is a greater number of sources, primary sources, available in Japan than there are in Europe. There's actually a high street, a high street called Jimbo Cho, um, specifically to go buy old manuals, his swords and ship manuals. You can get them. so when it comes to shinobi manuals or ninja manuals, they're really rare. They are genuinely rare. There's one powerhouse in Japan, which is the um, Ueno, or sorry, the Iga Museum. I use the word museum very lightly there. It's more like a theme park. And they have what's called the Fujita collection. And he collected most of them. And they've locked it down and nobody's allowed to see them. It's a treasure trove of about 300 ninja manuals that I would love to get my hands on. Then I would say there's probably about 200 more in the country somewhere. And, you know, I own about five originals, but they I got them by accident. But then we start getting down into the other things, like especially if you start searching for night attacks. If you search for night attacks, somewhere there's always, you know, a quote on that. So, yes, you will find ones in manual, in museums. You have to go and, you know, all the, the gloves job and cameras. But you can equally go to the shop and buy them there. And even Yahoo auctions. Now, I get mine from Yahoo auctions. There's tens, if not hundreds of thousands of scrolls in Japan. Crazy. <laughs> it's, it's a weird, as, as, as someone who's obviously been involved in um, researching European history since I was um, at university and before that, it's, it's quite literally foreign uh, kind of uh, concept uh, that these things are so widely available because uh, written sources that have potentially such uh, a big um, uh, what's the word? A big kind of uh, part to play in our establishing of understanding of history are are just not so uh, it's kind of widely available. Um, certainly, certainly to purchase in in Europe. Um, and you know, well, admittedly, they, the they say is it Tokyo was the biggest city in the world, or Edo, and it has some of the highest literacy rates in the world for medieval or you know early. Um, early modern people so they were just all writing their stuff and obviously at the end, sorry not obviously there is one thing where at the end it says uh, given to such a student for his dedication which means money 
I was told yeah. if it says that somebody's paid for a transcript. So here's my secrets. Tons of them going around. Well, it's funny, actually, because uh, uh, Edo period obviously goes into the 19th century. And, um, and funnily enough, once we get into 19th century um, uh, manuals and treatises, we do actually get a situation. And I've got a load of in that cabinet behind me. I've got a bunch of 19th century original manuals. But of course, they were printed. Uh, so they, you know, they weren't written out by hand or anything like that. They were they were printed and some of them have got dedications in and stuff. But um, so I guess there's perhaps a parallel there. Um, but it seems like in the scrolls being produced in Japan were being done by hand, I presume. Um, so they must have had huge numbers of people writing these things out. Well, you get, um, yes, you get the transcriptions, but you also get the woodblock prints. So sometimes famous military manuals were woodblock printed. So the one I always go to for ninjutsu is the Gumpo Joshin, what I said before. The reason is it's not written by a ninja. It was written by a strategist who was in the warring period and he gave this document to Tokugawa Ieyasu and said, what do you think? And Tokugawa Ieyasu, who's, by the way, guys, that's the, the original sort of shogun of the, the, the second half of samurai life. And basically he said, this is wonderful. And we know he took over the country with his strategy and said, this is wonderful. You should read this. That became woodblock printed. And when it talks about shinobi in there and how they work and how they do, we know we're starting to get quite a solid you know understanding of them but the other thing that comes in as well is these manuals like we're saying people are writing them down in different places at different times and a lot of the time they're keeping them secret so apart from the gunpo joshu everything else is a transmitted student to student manual yet they all reflect very similar things they're clearly not copied from each other but they are very much similar sort of art so for it not to be real or for it not to be realistic yes they're embellished of course you know if you do some magic spell gods will come and aid you and things like that but we know there's a, a theme going on throughout all of japan so before we move on to the next question um and based on what we've just been talking about what would you say for someone who wants to start reading primary source or as close to you know translation of primary source material about the shinobi what are the main sources you'd recommend they go to and look at right um do you mind if i pick up the books here no go for it yeah Are you sure that's okay right so there's something called the three great ninja manuals and they were considered as in the 20th century the greatest ones to get the information from because what a lot of people don't know is that I a lot of these manuals out there are sometimes just titles you know memorandums so you do get thousands of just memorandums so the number one one everybody should go for is the book of ninja this is the bansen shukai it was written by a man called fujibayashi in 1676 and basically he's saying he's basically saying ninjutsu is going it's declining nobody really studies it anymore it's too expensive to study we have to farm instead so i've collected everything and the name ban sen shu kai means a myriad of rivers coming together in one ocean which basically means there's the traditions i've collected so that's manual number one then you go for hattori hanzo's um his shinobi hidden now it might not be the famous hattori hanzo it's debated is it the famous one or is it not there's a complex discussion on that if you want to have it but well, that's in there. And the Gumpo Joshu is in there as well. Then you would go for True Path of the Ninja, which is basically the Shoninki. This was written by a man who was called Natori Masazumi, and he himself wrote about 30 manuals. And he said, we are losing our way as samurai. So they were genuinely losing their way. He said, everybody's just basically gambling, drinking, sword fighting, but strategy is dying. And they're the three great manuals. However, we did. I found this actually. It wasn't known before. We found this, and I found it on a, a weird spur idea. And it's this one, but I call it Chikamatsu Shigenori's manuals. The names are different. But I said to Yoshi, my translator, I said, Yoshi, let's search for Kan, because everybody knows Shinobi no Mono or Ninja, but how many people know the word Kanja? No one. But Kanja is equally used as much as Shinobi. In fact, Sun Tzu's Out of War, the thirteenth chapter is. Um, Yokan, the use of spines. Uh -huh. So we searched in that, and it, when we got those scrolls back, we had them photographed ninja, ninja, ninja. It was well, Shinobi. It was yeah. amazing. That's interesting. And it also alludes to the connection with Chinese military history, of course, and Chinese culture, which 
I won't go into now because that's probably a whole, <laughs> whole other video by its own uh, by its own right. So that's that's great. Really, really super useful, I think, for viewers. Um, so my next question is the one that could potentially be contentious. And before yep. um, I ask it, obviously, when people have vested interests in any martial art or anything from history, there's going to be uh, arguments, there's going to be drama, there's going to be conflict. So some of that might uh, be part and parcel of the answer to this question. But the question is, what are the biggest misconceptions about ninjas or shinobi today? So the massive misconceptions fall into two categories. So number one is the contentious one. If you don't know what I'm talking about, guys, basically there's the ninja martial art. Everybody says ninjutsu, and I'm going to avoid the term martial art and just use hand-to-hand -hand combat. And by hand-to-hand -hand combat, I mean weapons, not unarmed combat. You know, anything like that. So... In the 1970s or 1960s into 1970s, there was one gentleman called Takamatsu who taught a man called Masaki Hatsumi and they were a very small group and he claimed to be one of the last ninjas. He also claimed to have beat professional sumo wrestlers and a gang of 60 men at a bridge, you know what I mean? And to have been an assassin for the government and to have been a spy in China. That's part of the story. But this is the man we're looking at. And what happens is, Masaki Atsumi, who studies under him, passes it on to Stephen Hayes. Stephen Hayes comes to Black Belt Magazine, USA, and then we get this massive ninja hand-to-hand -hand combat fighting system. But there is, it's not only that it doesn't exist in history, it doesn't fit in history. So a lot of people say, oh, you know, just because it's not there doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know, history is like a massive jigsaw, basically everyone. You get the pieces in, and if you're missing some, you can see the shapes what are missing. You can see something's missing there, and we don't have that answer. But this is like a total wrong shape trying to wedge into something. It just doesn't match. So the idea of ninjutsu or shinobu no jutsu being hand-to-hand -hand combat is a misconception. It doesn't exist. The second one is the black-clad shuriken throwing, you know, doing this person, assassin. Assassin is the worst one who fights against the samurai, doing the dirty side, while samurai do the honourable side. That is total nonsense. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, for, for my part, um, obviously I come at this particular topic as being fascinated by these things, like behind me, the, the arms and armour. And um, I remember when I started trying to learn more about Japanese arms and armour, it became very rapidly evident to me that um, what I saw presented as ninja weapons uh some of them were real you know were just real japanese weapons that weren't particular to ninja they were just weapons that were used in japan others of them seem to have been either completely made up or misunderstood i mean a typical example is the ninja sword you know which it's what is it it's a you know it's not it the idea that the ninja had some special type of sword that only they used <laughs> is yeah, yeah. amusing to say the least um, especially that it happens to be essentially a straight bladed uh, type of sword that you would have found earlier in the kind of 8th century Japan. Um, but um, yeah, so clearly also if you want to be um, kind of undercover, then wearing a uniform that kind of goes, look at me, I'm different to everybody else. I'm going to wear a mask and I'm going to dress in black and uh, throw shurikens at people and um it just it was all just rather comical i think when you actually think about it um but in terms of ninjutsu i mean i've certainly whether we call a bujinkan ninjutsu and obviously those are interconnected uh, into different degrees um and throughout my life i have known people that have studied um uh, bujinkan for example and i think the way that it's often been presented as far as i've seen is that bujinkan will encapsulate some teachings that are from samurai schools and some that are from ninja schools and Bujikan is bringing this into one what what's your view of of that and is that is that a real thing is there how much truth is there how much fiction is there how much marketing is there that kind of so the Bujinkan is a modern term so Bujinkan when you look at can in the end of Japanese terms it means house of so it's house of the warrior gods and basically it's always your dojo name so your name of your, your school is at the top so for example i i've resurrected an old school called natoryu and the monk that we have following us has named my dojo 
um, Kyugaku Kan, the House of Deep Study. So Bujikan is often misunderstood in that way. It's just an organization name. But mm -hmm. in the Bujikan, they claim to have nine schools. And some of them schools are absolutely real. They, they are real. Kukishin is one. Kukishin is a really old family who do sort of stuff. But they have these three mysterious ninja schools attached to the end. One of them is named after... Um, this is difficult to say because there, the word exists in Japanese, but it's named Kumo Gakure, hidden beneath the clouds, basically. And But it appears in a 1910 um, comic or adventure story. Okay. So, And one of the ancestors, they say, is in their lineage, actually comes from a comic story. So it's like me saying, <laughs> I have a Knights nice Templar and I've got Wolverine in my lineage. Yeah, <laughs> it's that. That, to a Japanese person, would be like, Really? <laughs> so over the years, they've tried to explain that. And, it's, and to be fair to them, it's not in the main lineage, but it's 100% there. And so what we found is that they've mixed truth and fake things, if you like, or made up things. And it seems to have been a harmless piece of fun for someone and a group of just people doing a bit of, you know, research into old ways and makes a... But of course, Stephen Hayes comes along, makes it mega famous. 150,000 people, according to the Bujikan, which I think is a low estimate, trained with them. And the next thing, you know, diehard fans who, who've offered me sword fights, offered to kill me, took photographs outside of my house because they're like, you are, we hate you, Cummins. You know, so that's the problem we have. Yeah, I mean, and it's a business, isn't it? I think I think a lot of martial arts schools at the end of the day will be a business. And, and, and when uh, anything's thrown into question, um, then, like you say, you'll get some very hardcore supporters who have really perhaps dedicated their lives to this particular thing um, and, and they get upset about it. But putting that aside, I suppose, from my point of view, because to be completely frank to viewers on here, I actually I find it interesting, but it, I haven't got a um, I haven't got any horse in the race really. Um, I have never really studied any Japanese martial arts apart from a little bit of kendo, and um, I yeah, so I don't have a vested interest in either side. Um, do you think that so so within Bujikan, as you said, there are some very genuine and legitimate mm. um ryu you know schools uh, from japan presumably that were just like various different uh jiu-jitsu or other uh, kenjitsu yeah. schools that have been brought into the teachings have been brought into and uh compressed should we say into the the under the umbrella of bujinkan the ninjitsu side of it um what is what do as you see it, what did they do in the ninjutsu bit? Uh, and why do they regard that as ninjutsu rather than whatever else um, they, they do? This is, this is actually the puzzling piece, actually. I don't really know, but they have retrofitted now. And so everybody's aware I was a Bujinkan member. I went to Japan and I studied with the Bujinkan. And that's where my doubts started to come in. So I've not come in from the side and said, you know, I hate this. I, it, for me, if it was real, it would make my life very easy. But it, it's, you know, it's a difficult one. So what, we've, what I found is that originally, out of the nine schools, if you get rid of those, two of the ninja schools are not really taught. And even people question what's in them. So the main one is Togakure Ryu, which is like um, the door school. Or the, no, it's actually a name from, I think, Indian literature or something around there. And in there, if you go back to the original form of it, there are various kata, but there are also things like you lie on a wall and when a guard comes past, you kneel them in the face and then you roll off the wall. And then there's like climb up to a tree and throw some shuriken to kill the guards coming towards you. But then also they seem to have these unarmed kata, which admittedly are based on escape techniques, which is OK, because actually in the ninja schools, we do have escape techniques, but they're not hand-to-hand -hand combat so much they're more like you set firecrackers in a tree and when you need to go a, a friend lights the firecrackers people think it's muskets and off you go that uh -huh. type of thing but they then sort of like in the 70s or 80s combined everything into what's called sort of nimpo taijutsu and they just created this martial art which and if you follow the bujikan you can pretty much make anything up they've dropped the katas they've dropped everything and you're doing ninjutsu but they then realized this was a problem and changed the word to Budo Taijutsu and have now dropped the word Ninjutsu. But everybody joins them because it's ninja fighting. So it's such a mess right. that, you know, 
it's a problem. It's interesting to me that, that so within Bridge and Cairn, they, they've obviously got lots of things which have been handed down for however many generations within, you know, legitimate lineages. It, I find it interesting that they do have this kind of subterfuge, kind of uh, covert uh, warfare stuff in there. Surely some of that must come down from Shinobi lineages. Well, so where they actually get that from is taken straight out of stuff like these books. So okay. these were the three great manuals. So what they did is uh, Takamatsu, they were out in the mid 20th century and the comics were out, they had the ninja boom. And you can clearly see like, for example, there's the six tools of the ninja in the Shonen kit, and they've got seven tools and they've added a ladder, you know, that type of thing. But that doesn't mean it's not real ninjutsu, it is. But it's from historical documentation that was made popular by men like Fuji Taseko and Yumi Onawa. Okay. So just before I move off this topic, because I realise I'm kind of probing on this one, um, <laughs> well, partly because partly because I think it's my job as a, as a neutral person, and I understand some people are going to be watching this who might be from other camps or whatever, and I want them to feel a, a bit like maybe I've asked some, some questions that have um, uh, not put you on the spot so much, but kind of probed some of yeah. your assertions. So what would you say if people wanted to um, study the ways that the shinobi actually operated and the the physical skills in term including the fighting skills perhaps um which might just boil down to studying kenjitsu and jujitsu but I'd, I'd be interested to to hear your take on that if somebody wanted to study in the ways of the ninja or that that actually learn shinobi skills how would you recommend that they do it now Right, okay. So, obviously taking the Bujikan aside, you can still join the Bujikan and it's still be not a problem because I want to make clear that I, I don't in any way um, have a go at their martial arts. I don't like people who have a go at other people's martial arts. If they are good fighters, it's good fighters. That's fine. But it's not clandestine operations. So what you have to do is realise when you follow the way of the ninja, you're actually following the way of the samurai. So what you do is you're joining some sort of Ryuha, some sort of Kenjutsu school, you're learning Naginata, but then there's a massive piece missing in the um, traditional Japanese schools, and that is called Gunjutsu. Not gun, our gun, but their gun means um, military, and we would consider it as military strategy. So I always found it really bizarre that in all of the manuals that were translated, all the books on Samurai and Ninja, none of the strategy was in there. It was just, you know, how to use a sword or how to draw quickly. I'm like, what about the rest of it? So of all the things you should be learning, shoot an arrow, use a sword, use pole arms, unarmed combat, and um, aquatic warfare is a massive one, but then horse riding, and then also military strategy for moving with troops, and then espionage. So unfortunately, then you can't physically go anywhere and as much as I don't want to keep sort of plugging my work, I, because of this problem, I created, uh, or created the wrong word, but reopened a school called Natoryu. Uh, but that doesn't teach all the ninjas, it only teaches one branch of it. So what you'd have to do is learn those skills and then get the different manuals and implement them. But you're looking at things like that can be quite illegal. So you're looking at gunpowder, explosives, you're looking at poisons, you're looking at following people who don't know you're following them, breaking into people's houses, lock picking, and then uh, also black arts, black magic, animal cruelty. So that starts to get, and then also um, language, dialect. And then of course, the, the other one you can do is sort of the Darren Brown stuff, the sort of psychology of deception. Uh -huh. And if you put all that together, you could pretty much follow the way of the ninja. So in real terms, a, a normal person, certainly living in the UK, a lot of the um, skills and knowledge that the, that the shinobi had, you could only learn, you could only learn the theory of and you couldn't actually really uh, practice. Um, in terms of the sort of the fighting aspect of it, um, presumably a lot of that was just uh, generic it wasn't necessarily specific like learning to use a katana and wakazashi for example you yep. could learn that in any kenjutsu school um perhaps even kendo um ei um things like this so presumably if you wanted to get close to 
some understanding of some of the legal aspects of what you can learn uh, from the shinobi, then you would essentially do a lot of the traditional Japanese arts. You probably, if you were a kid, you'd start out doing judo, perhaps, um, and then maybe later on jujitsu, and then uh, kenjitsu, ei, kendo, um, uh, archery. I can't remember kyudo, kyudo, um, uh, and, kyudo or yeah, kyujutsu, yeah. depending. Yeah, and so presumably you'd you'd kind of do learn all of those things, and obviously horse riding, um, you can learn uh, anywhere. Um, although there are some specific aspects to Japanese horse riding, which obviously the saddles and the stirrups are different and things like that, I suppose. But um, so presumably it's a question of doing that, basically learning lots of little bits of uh, things. So um, what do you, out of interest, what what do you do, like in terms of? Uh, Japanese swordsmanship. Do you study Japanese swordsmanship or? No, that's, I'm sure you're, that's a whole new question. That I, That's going to be the second lot I'm going to do is Japanese swordsmanship. So to, let me just go back a little bit first before I get onto that. So if you want to train in the ninja, what one thing that is, when you read the ninja manuals, that's missing is the real person doing it. So if I can explain how a ninja, you to give you an, an idea of what a ninja would be like in real life, is imagine somebody, an undercover agent, going into the cartels. So you've got a local, the local government is possibly inefficient, or the local government is a warlord, or like, say, the African warlords. You have to go into the enemy camp, pretend to be one of them, but then bring them down. Or you have to, um, for example, creep into a cartel's manor house, murder the cartel. That's assassination. We should talk about assassination, but basically set fire to it or get information out of it and do the same in Africa. That's how difficult being a ninja would really be. And of course, going in there, you would do your esoteric rituals, your talismans. Uh, they actually take the, the teeth out of a live snake and put it in their hair. Or what they do is on a lunar eclipse, they scrape some wood off and bring the darkness of the lunar eclipse into a talisman and put it in their hair. And then they go in under the cover of like invisibility. So you've got all them aspects to do. But, so what I'm trying to say is you've got the person, if you, you have got the bottle to go and do that, everything else is just an auxiliary thing. So he talks about horses. So when a shinobi, when you want to go on a secret mission, but you're going with a horse because it's you're approaching somewhere at long distance, you cloth up the legs, you put wet paper on the bits, you tie everything up. You, they even used to open the horse's mouth and tie the tongue with string so it couldn't neigh. And then that's how you get in closer. And then obviously you get out of that. So talking about archery, um, a shinobi, when they infiltrate, they would take an, a bow with two arrows. They put one arrow, knock one arrow and put the other arrow out that way. And what they would do is they would probe the room in the darkness. Remember, we're talking about utter darkness and shinobi always infiltrate after the half moon or the quarter moon. They only infiltrate when it goes into a period of darkness or wind and rain, so it's a very dark night. And if somebody's there waiting for you, the, the, the long arrow will hit them, you'll drop it out of your hands, then release and shoot them. But then you're off, you scamper, and you do that <laughs> sort of stuff. So ninjutsu is one of those where people say, can I train in it? And when I show them what it is, they get very bored very quickly because you take away the danger of it, because obviously you're not really doing it. And then you take away the martial arts, you take away everything. So you have to rebuild that up. So, yes, a shinobi would be an excellent fighter. They would be great at these things. Climbing walls, secret codes, arrows, burning, fire skills. So you have to put it like a university degree, put bits and bits on you. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like in the modern world, the closest parallel, which we, which we mentioned before, would be special forces or um, secret service or something like this, uh, where, of yeah. course, you'd learn a lot of comparable modern world sort of skills that uh, you'd apply in a, in a modern world situation um, with firearms rather than bows and blah, blah, blah. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's super interesting stuff. Right. Um, this has been um, really great. I want to finish off with two questions, which are more personal to you. Um, and then in, uh, hopefully if we do future videos, we can drill down perhaps into some of the more uh, nitty gritty of some of the specific historical details or whatever. So the first thing I wanted to ask was, um, how do you think your work, your research, your videos, everything else has been received and has changed how some people are practicing, training or thinking about some traditional Japanese martial arts, specifically Bujinkan slash ninjutsu? 
Right. Well, you fall into two camps here. There's the, which I think is a bit strange, actually. You fall into the diehard Anthony Cummings lovers. No matter what I say, even if I get something wrong, they will say it's right. Uh, whatever I say is correct. And they're absolutely stringent on that. And then the opposite end is that we hate Anthony Cummings. Whatever he says is wrong. And I'm approaching it with like, I've only come here, guys, to question. Let's question it. Here's the documents. What do you think? And I'm building it towards. But no, it just seems to be that they have just run to two sides of the camp and they all now argue with each other. I'm like, no, let's bring it back together. So that. And in Japan, um, we've been met with quite, posit quite a lot of positivity, actually. So I've done some lectures in Japan and I have to have a translator translate. Uh, well, it's usually my translation partner, Yoshie. And one of the best things I heard was... Um, the, the guy, the head of Eager Tourist Board, who runs all the sort of history section there, he said, Anthony, I don't believe you. After, he, after my lecture, I said, what do you mean? He went, you, you really know your stuff and you can't speak Japanese. I don't believe you know that. And he's laughing, you know, he's very nice. And the Japanese tend to have taken us very nicely. However, there's an undercurrent of jealousy in the sort of that's happened because I'm a foreigner and my translation provider is a woman. And of course, they're not sexist, but they're very traditional. So yeah. that comes as a bit of a like, so it does rub them up the wrong way. But like in everything in Japan, everyone's ultra polite and nice. Yeah, I've actually in, in a former job, I was a civil servant and I actually led on uh, relations with Japan. So I've, I've dealt with the Japanese quite a bit. And yeah, what you described very much, uh, I can imagine yeah. the, <laughs> how, it, <laughs> uh, how it pans out. Um, in terms of the, you talked about these two camps. Do you think that there is a new movement of studying the ninja, should we call them shinobi, based on some of the things that you, the kind of the movement that maybe the ball that you set rolling, do you believe that that is the beginning of a new movement? Uh, yes, I do. However, I more realise that it's killed the ninja. I did that documentary you talked about, the online one, and it's the yeah. man that killed the ninja. Because uh, another man from a Koryu school, Alex Alera from Italy, he was like, Anthony, have you realised in the last about five to ten years, nobody's wearing a ninja mask and nobody's throwing shuriken anymore? And then, I, and I, what I've found is that it's hit a wall and people are just not interested in it. At first, they're like, that's amazing. That's it. But once you realise it's actually really difficult, like calculating the moon rise and moon set without any modern equipment is part of ninjutsu. And they just go, that's not for me. You know, it's yeah. too much. But... It's definitely altered. Nobody really calls ninjutsu anti combat anymore, or very few, and everybody's now integrating it with it. So my actual dream is for people like the Bujikan, the Genbukan, all of those people to just change the way they dress, which I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about, get out of the karate geese and be a bit more traditional, or just not karate geese, and then also implement these documents. I did it for that very reason, to sort of change the world of ninjas. That's a really um, illuminating answer. And it also touches on what I was going to ask for the final question, actually. So what you've um, implied there is how what you would like to see from the future of this movement, if we call it that. But turning on a tangent slightly, so taking that theme and applying it to you personally, what is your what are your next personal goals for the next five or 10 years of what you've been doing? What would you like to do for yourself? Right. So we've come to a point in ninjutsu where, or shinobu no jutsu, where we sort of know it, most of it. Any new scroll that comes now, it's, it's similar. Like I said, they're not the same, but they're similar. How to creep into a wall, how to use the five types of spies, talismans, you like, it's the same thing. So we've, we've come away from that now because I came into it through the ninja, but then I realized the ninja are actually samurai. And then I did the samurai and then you're like, oh, wow, well, Japan's got a lot of sort of Chinese culture based here. You know, there's a lot of Chinese culture in there. So I've done art of war. I've done yin yang. I'm doing lots of other things. So what I'm going to be doing now is broadening it so we understand where the ninjas sit in the horizon. You know, where where do they sit in culture? Because before that, everybody's like, oh, ninja are here and Japan is here. You're like, no, let's put them back in and let's integrate them all. And the other one is actually swordsmanship. So I'm going to, and I have challenged every Ko Ryu in the world to a friendly match to see. Now, I technically have no sword training, technically, but I've trained in different martial arts. But I don't think the Japanese swordsmanship is exactly right. It's not quite like the Shinobi stuff, but I think there's a few misunderstandings in that. The swordsmanship is <laughs> a very interesting. Yeah, the swordsmanship is a very interesting topic. And um, I have been 
Well, I don't know how much I should talk about this, but I've been I've been toying with I've spoken to you about it in private. I've been toying with uh, going into uh, the the world of Japanese swordsmanship. But as I say, I've done a little bit of kendo in the past, and it's um, it's complicated, obviously, because all of the different Japanese swordsmanship schools come at it slightly differently. They've got different histories, different lineages, uh, and they have survived history somewhat differently. If you see what I mean, um, right. and you know, kendo now. Is very different to kendo in the 1940s, and equally that was very different to uh, gekiken or geken, as it's sometimes known, it, at the end of the 19th century. And in itself, that was also quite different to what it was starting out in the 17th century, and when there was the split between the people who sparred and the people who didn't spar, or, mm. or fenced and didn't fence, whatever terminology you want to use for it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a very complicated. <laughs> um uh topic um to get into and in terms of um in terms of challenging people that's also problematic of course because most traditional japanese swordsmanship schools don't necessarily do anything like sparring as as we would know it in hema for example um but there is a growing movement of people in japan and incidentally in china and, and korea and other places in asia where they're actually taking a HEMA approach and in many cases putting HEMA gear on and going to HEMA sword manufacturers and getting them to make HEMA like versions of whether it's uh, you know Jian or, or Katana or whatever um, and and sparring but of course that doesn't mean that they could just be reinventing a new thing it doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that that's something with a, with a tradition to it and I am, I am actually personally interested in the traditional um, schools and I think there's also a parallel there with Europe because very often, you know, one of the things that really bugs me is when people say, oh, well, you know, everybody's got two arms and two legs. How many ways are there to use a sword? Actually, it turns out quite a lot of different ways of using a sword. And uh, <laughs> if you take a simple one handed uh, cross hilted sword, we've got tons of different treatises that actually use them, you know, s relatively differently to each other. So you can have different lineages that develop to, to use a weapon in different ways for different reasons, different contexts, slightly different period, different clothing, different armour, you know, different laws, maybe all sorts of different uh, differences that maybe slightly change why people are using weapons slightly differently to each other. Um, so, yeah, it's a complicated, complicated topic. But uh, I think absolutely it sounds like going into that world to 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 try and learn more about the swordsmanship side of things sounds like a very good thing to do. If I personally... Uh, was delving more into the Japanese um, martial sort of cultural martial world. I think the unarmed arts, are, especially jujitsu, are, are important, um, mm. uh, especially when it comes to well applying that unarmed to the to the armed fighting, uh, whether it's naginata, katana, tachi, whatever. Um, but additionally, fighting in armor. And, and I'm always struck by the parallels between armored Japanese techniques and armored European techniques and how on a very basic fundamental level, a lot of it comes down to wrestling because the great thing about armor is it, it nullifies some of the effectiveness of the weapons. And so you end up coming close, you end up wrestling uh, to try and then get an opening to get one of the weapons, you know, into a gap and this yeah. kind of stuff. Um, so that's super interesting stuff. And I think it's interesting. Some of the armored techniques have survived in some of the Kenjutsu uh, schools. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think it sounds like it, what, what's your actual, what do you know what your approach is? Do you know what the next thing you're going to do in your training kind of? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, one of the big problems I found with swords, so I'm only at the beginning of this swordsmanship, this swords thingy. So I'm nowhere like I did start the ninja about 15 years ago and I'm literally just starting again. But a few key problems flag up. And that is, I've gone to meet sword masters in Japan and they say, oh, Anthony, what we do now, we might have been going for 400 years, but it's totally changed. They were like, if I, and one of them was like, if our master came in a time machine, now he'd be like, what are you doing? He says, we know it's changed. That's not, you know, and they say, we've lost this many, we've lost that, that's changed. We you sit down instead of standing up. And there's a big, it's like looking at um, maybe the curtains of a theatre. There's a massive section we can't see of Japanese swordsmanship. That's just hidden from us. So the samurai pop up around the year 1000 and they go about 18 odd, you know, there's almost a thousand years, depending on how you clock it up. 
And all sorts of shit tends to stop at about 1500. Some of those schools do trace off into earlier times. But if you ask an expert on Japanese sword history of the schools, they all come down to like either three or seven different school branches. Yeah. But that isn't the case beyond that, th th uh, beyond that curtain. We just don't know where it's from. And what the other key element is, we know that around the 1500s to the 1600s, swordsmanship changed dramatically. Mm. And it really changed to become, they called it flowery swordsmanship. And Musashi himself is like, what are they doing? He's like, that doesn't work. You know, that's rubbish. And he's arguing. So we've got... Well, there, were, there, were, there were even changes in, in sword um, blade details at that, at that point. And, and famously in the, in the 17th century, um, there was a tendency to go to slightly straighter blades. Uh, in the Kanban era, um, straighter, more tapered. They're a little bit more balanced towards the hand, they tend to be. Um, so, yeah, there were definitely movements, uh, just the same as we see in Europe, in perhaps what we see is the swordsmanship is at one point dictated more by battlefield considerations, and then it's more dictated by dueling uh, considerations, mm -hmm. either dueling just to show that this school is the best or, um, you know, dueling for, for even comp kind of competition uh, kind of mindset. And then, of course, we get the introduction of the, the Shinai um, uh, and it going even more into a more of a, uh, perhaps should we say, sporting uh, kind of context and lots of changes uh, there. And obviously in the modern kendo world, the way that the Shinai is used is quite substantially different from the way that most people use a, a Japanese sword in most kenjutsu schools because, of course, they're not so worried about well, generally speaking, they're not so worried about being hit as, as you yeah. are in most Kenjutsu, but especially the hands. And, you know, the big thing is, is holding the sword out in front uh, in a way that you do see in some treatises, um, particularly from the 17th century onwards. Um, but it does seem to be there's a change there. There's, there's differences. And we see some parallels with European swordsmanship there. What I would say is uh, I, I started looking at some of the fencing treatises. Well, not and not just for swords as well. They obviously cover Yari and Naginata um, as well. And um, I think there is, I think there's a growing hunger for a HEMA-like approach yeah. to Japanese swordsmanship where you kind of go, okay, maybe study, study with one of the existing schools with a lineage, but then also go back to the source and go, okay, well, what was so-and-so saying in 16 whatever? What were they actually saying about source of tradition? How, how, how can I apply what I know from whether it's kendo, EI, kenjitsu, whatever? How can I apply what I've learned in that to what they were saying three, four hundred years ago or more? Um, and what are the differences and, and this kind of stuff? I think it's a very, very interesting uh, approach uh, to doing it. But then the question, especially with Japanese swordsmanship, is always, how do you test it? Um, and, yeah. and a lot of, you know, if you're doing jiu-jitsu, you get on the mats and you roll around and you do it. Um, but with kenjitsu, it's a little bit more complicated because there's not so much fencing or sparring opportunity within Japan, at least within the traditional Japanese swordsmanship world. I suppose you'd have to get like things that you trust, really. I suppose people you trust. So people, that's my question is, do we trust Musashi's thing because you know you go through the documentation he really was there he was really doing stuff but yet you know he's saying we shouldn't trust the other people but also what really fails like doesn't appear is uh, multiple opponents doesn't seem to feature very often like one of the main things we know about Japanese warfare is it was literally gangs on people and you can very quickly come across even in the Edo period gang approaching Musashi I fought this gang I fought that gang but it all yeah. seems to have disappeared one man versus yeah, there's, I mean, that's another interesting parallel, again, with the European stuff, because, of course, most treatises are one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, they're, they're, you know, we're having a duel, basically. It's, it's um, or Whether it's a knightly duel in armour or whether it's a civilian duel, that, you know, with rapier and dagger or whatever, it tends to be a one-on-one -on -one scenario. And I think um, it's difficult for people to make treatises and make manuals uh, about fighting multiple opponents because you're usually screwed if there's multiple opponents, <laughs> um, uh, you know, run away is the general advice. Um, one of the earliest bits of advice we've got is run away. And then when the fastest one starts to catch up with you, turn around, hit him, then run away again. And when the next fastest one, that's German advice from the 14th century. It's fairly, fairly basic, but yes, yeah, it sounds fairly, you know, fairly common sense. But um but, but what there was one sword, there's one sword master today of Taisha Ryu. 
And I spoke to him on Skype and he says he thinks the best swordsmanship was actually in the late 1800s or the second part of the 1800s. Because before that, in the end, wherever we always go back to Sekigahara and the Osaka campaigns, everything, he said that's projectile weapons, spears, gang fighting, and even muskets. He says, but yet when they were like, when the Tok Tokugawa Shogun was collapsing, it was all infighting in streets and bars and yeah. Kyoto. So he said, you probably find your best swordsman in that point there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic, anyway, and we could, we could, we've probably Go gone on, further right. into the into the swordsmanship. And uh, you know, there's just to very briefly mention uh, kudo, um, the archery side of it as well. And I know people who are doing uh, traditional, obviously English heavy war bow shooting, but also Asian, uh, looking at uh, you know Manchu archery and Turkish archery and all sorts Persian archery. And one of the elephants in the room when it comes to Japanese traditional archery is that it's become a very ritualized specific activity using very light draw weight bows and holding them at full draw for a very long period of time. And of course, that's very different to the way that we know that they were practicing archery way back uh, in that they were using heavier draw weights. Very often they were doing mounted archery. And obviously there is some mounted archery still happening in, in Japan, um, but they were using heavier draw weights and, uh, and it wasn't it was a slightly different activity to what it is today. So, uh, and as far as I, I actually don't personally know anybody using Japanese um, bows at the heavier draw weights and looking at what they can do. But I know that scientifically Japanese uh, Yumi are good, you know, the good efficient bows that, that they were a massive, Japan was a massive archery nation, as you know, yeah. and, and you know, the samurai were primarily archers basically until the Mongols came along who were probably better archers um, and they decided let's try something else. Um, and, um, you know, it wasn't really until probably the 14th century when they switched their mindset, I think, from being more shooting arrows at each other to more charging with lances and naganata at each other. Well, it's one of those things where people, especially Western people, I don't think Japanese people make the mistake, but Western people do. And I did, and we all did, is that you watch Kudo and you're like, oh, that's Japanese archery. Like, no, that's Japanese esoteric ceremonial archery connected yeah. to Zen. Yeah. No one on a battlefield would ever do that. And the Japanese would tell you that, like, why would you do that on a battlefield? You know, that's yeah. just ridiculous. So you can see black and white footage of some of the last war schools and they literally just creeping up behind their Osode and they're literally bang, Bank. They don't even do the round pull. They just wham, dump, and ki they're shouting ki eyes. And we do know that Yoshitsune had a really powerful bow. He said it took three men to bend. Uh, not just, sorry, no, sorry. There is bows that take three men to bend. But a man called Yoshitsune actually tried to retrieve his bow because he was like, and people, and he nearly died. And people say, what are you doing? What are you doing? He says, it's not very strong and they'll think I'm weak. <laughs> well, the idea was it was like, you know, this, these men are so strong. But then we know in the Natori scrolls, it says, don't have so th so that's like the 1100s by the 1600s they're saying have weaker bows not weak bows but weaker bows and take the tips off so that they come off in the body so they've got to be yeah. strong enough to penetrate and the tips have to come off because you need to shoot all day in formation you're not running around on a horse anymore with one arrow there and one arrow there so the actual style changes well also the opponents they were shooting at have probably changed to some extent and there were large large perhaps large numbers of ashikaru yeah. wearing not very much so yeah a different different yeah. situation whereas obviously the if we come to kind of england and france 100 years war completely different priority and these very heavy bows are obviously because there's an increasing number of people on the battlefield who are wearing some degrees of armor and you know you need to kind of ensure that the arrows are having some kind of effect still um i think just to kind of cap it off one of the overall themes when we've been talking about swordsmanship archery and also shinobi or ninja is that one of the great things about japan is it's got this continual living tradition but that's yeah. that's also can be a weakness because it can pull you away from the original source sometimes and we've seen that with swordsmanship we've seen that with archery and you know you you would argue that we've seen that with the ninja as well um and that sometimes with living traditions and living lineages you, you get further and further away from the source and sometimes it's easier to go if you want to find out what the source really is is to go back to the source and of course with HEMA, that's exactly what we do. We haven't had the living. I mean, yeah, we've got modern sport fencing, we've got boxing, we've got certain times of wrestling. But fundamentally, if you want to know how a longsword was used in the 15th century, the only way really to find out 
is go and look at a fencing treatise from the 15th century. Um, and yes, you know, lots of people will argue, oh, but there's so much you learn from a teacher and from a lineage that you don't get from a book. Yes, that's true. But equally, at least you're actually, getting it straight from the horse's mouth rather than through through however many generations of, of mouths. I actually fully agree with you here. I think it actually does more damage than it doesn't. It's great that you can see what they're doing, but I have looked at, take Yagyu Ryu, Yagyu Shinkagi Ryu. I've got, there's two lineages that come from literally two people who studied with the main master, totally different skills, totally different, and even the same names, different skills, yet they both came from the same person, have the same connection, mm. but they're different. Yeah. So the best way I can describe it is imagine like a Greek statue that's underwater and there's limpets and little things connecting to it. Koryu is like that. It's got an amazing central thing, but you need to chip away all the crap off it. Otherwise, you're left without a statue. So we, I mean, we've got a great example in, in the 16th century with um, uh, Achille Morozzo and um, uh, Manchilino, Antonio Manchilino, and they both had the same master. So their master, I believe, if I remember correctly, was De Luca. So De Luca was around about the year 1500 he was teaching, um, and uh, Morozzo wrote his book in 1536, and um, Manchilino wrote his book in 1531, if I remember correctly, one or two. And um, they don't contain the same material. They, they're, they're both in the same city in Italy in the same decade of the same century with the same, you know, same master with the same weapons, more or less. Um, they have some differences in which weapons they cover. And yet they don't teach exactly the same thing. You know, so, so each individual will add something that, yeah. uh, you know, and we've got a slightly, what's, what I believe is a slightly earlier Bolognese source as well, which has got other stuff in it, which is not in Manchelino and not in Morozzo. And that's, you're just talking about one city in a, a few decades of each other in, in Italy. Um, so absolutely, I think, you know, you're going to get drift, uh, mission drift, basically, from, from master student, master student. But what I would say... <laughs> is I am jealous to some degree of, um, uh, of, of traditional martial arts where they have a living lineage, where there are details which have come down, which are the sort of things which just wouldn't have survived, wouldn't have been noted down in a book, and that are personal, you know, kind of like a lifetime's experience kind of advice that you get from an 80-year-old sensei that you're not going to get from a a book written as an overview of this is the art in 1454 or whatever. Um, yeah. So I do think that there are ben benefits to living lineages hundred percent. And, and, and I've always been a fan of trying to learn as much as I can when there are living lineages of things. Uh, but if you want to learn about history, I think the best way to learn about history is not a person living today. It's a person yeah. who lived at the time. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, what, what, you're doing is is i think very similar and in alignment with what a lot of people are doing in hema and i know that you've studied hema a little bit as well haven't you i do, basically i've done, <laughs> I've done my arts for years but i was a bujikan member so technically i have nothing to do with koryu because they've made it up so with bujikan it depends on your teacher you get some amazingly strong men who are great fighters and you get some terrible ones so hopefully I was taught correctly. But I went to study, as I say, for like a month or two months in a Japanese place. And after he said, he said, this is not how it was originally done. We've changed this. That doesn't work. This is, I was just stopped. I was like, I don't want to learn the wrong thing. So what I'm doing is there are some treatises out there who really do, like the Hema stuff, write it down. So mm -hmm. what I've had to do is cut it off. Like, I shouldn't really be saying this, but if you look at Miyamoto Masashi's Gorin No Show and look at Niten Ichiryu, Compare the original Japanese, not the English translation, because the English translators fit them to whatever they've seen in the new, in Nito, Nitenichi Ryu, and actually go to the original, and it doesn't match so much. Not fully, but you're like, that's not what he just said. Do you know, and that becomes a, so I would trust Musashi over the modern one, definitely. Yeah. Well, on that note, on that bombshell. <laughs> Let's, this has been really illuminating and probably we've uh, talked for long enough, I think. Uh, for, but we've actually gone a mixture of overview and deep in this video. So hopefully uh, you've kept watching for the whole thing. Thank you if you have done, if you stayed with us. Check out that, those links below. Watch um, Anthony's documentary because it's a really well put together. Regardless of even if you don't dis even if you don't agree actually with chunks of what Anthony says or bits of his research or his approach or whatever, 
watch the documentary because it's actually a really well put together um, documentary and I hugely enjoyed watching it. It was very, very watchable, nicely edited and everything else. So go and check that out. And obviously the link to uh, Anthony's channel. If you want to find out way more detail about every aspect of uh, the ninja or shinobi, then obviously um, Anthony's got tons of videos on his channel. So go and check that out as well. Thank you very much for um, giving me your time this evening uh, and joining me. Hopefully this will be the first of some, you know, uh, some future videos. Uh, if there are specific things that you're, if you're watching this video, there, there are specific things you would like us to look at in the future, then comment, post below, ask us. Uh, and it might be that, you know, Anthony or me or both of us don't know the answer right now, um, but uh, maybe we do. And maybe it's something we could look into for you. Uh, so thanks a lot for watching. Thanks again, Anthony. Thank you very much. It was lovely. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for watching. And I will see you back on this channel. And hopefully Anthony will see you over on his channel as well soon. Cheers for watching, folks. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.